Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ray Wang from Tsinghua University. So today I'll be uh, presenting our work on micromechanical origin of large post-liquefaction shear strain. Um, first, I'll talk about the basic phenomena of post-liquefaction shear strain. Now, as we are all aware of, slow liquefaction is one of the main causes of seismic structure damage. And studies since the 1960s have really enhanced our understanding of liquefaction, especially um, with respect to liquefaction potential or liquefaction susceptibility. However, um, over the past decade, we have seen uh, large or a lot of liquefaction induced damages, um, which have been very devastating. And this means that there is more research needed on liquefaction deformation mechanism, especially after the 2018 Palu earthquake, where we saw um, large shear deformation of liquefied soil of over a kilometer that traveled over a kilometer. During several past earthquakes, we have um, observed many soil liquefaction induced uh, failures that are associated with large shear strain. Uh, for example, to the left, we can see the sliding of the Muin Dam, which occurred during the 1978 Tangshan earthquake in China. And we have also often observed lateral spreading behind key walls, as was in the Kobe earthquake. Now, Using uh, laboratory element tests, uh, we can make more observations on this post liquefaction shear deformation. Now, here I'm showing two typical undrained cyclic tests on sand. And as we can see, uh, the shear strain, there is a lot of shear strain that is accumulated after soil reaches initial liquefaction. So, after the soil reaches zero effective stress, we see a lot of shear strain accumulation. Now we call this shear strain post-liquefaction shear strain. Now, uh, there are some very interesting features about this post-liquefaction shear strain, which we call gamma naught. Uh, this gamma naught has limited value. So once soil enters into liquefaction, it does not shear indefinitely. Uh, it has a bounded value and it is generated at the liquefaction state, so at zero effective stress. And this gamma naught increases with the number of loading cycles, as we can see here, um, depicted by these blue lines, uh, while the stress pass and stress strain relationships during non-liquefaction state remains unchanged. So the shear strain is accumulated specifically at zero effective stress. Now, this accumulation of gamma naught with increasing load cycles is not is also bounded, so it's not infinite. Um, its accumulation slows down and eventually saturates at a specific level. So, to summarize our observations, this post liquefaction shear strain is large, but it has bounded value. It accumulates with load cycles, but it eventually converges to a saturated value. So this shows us that liquefied soil is not a simple fluid, as one might think. And we see that we can, we can think that particles also play a role in the behavior of this liquefied um, material. So we need to ask ourselves two questions. Um, the first one is, what is the particle scale origin of this post-liquefaction shear strain gamma naught? And if we know this particle scale origin, then we have to ask ourselves, how does this particle scale origin affect macro scale soil behavior to cause this large shear strain? So first, we look at its micromechanical origin. In order to achieve this, um, we conducted a series of undrained biaxial DM tests using constant volume um, boundary conditions under quasi-static loading. So, if we compare our DM simulations with actual physical test results, we can see that the DM simulation is able to 
quite well, quanti sorry, qualitatively reflect the liquefaction behavior observed in physical tests. We see the decrease in effective stress during undrained cyclic loading, eventually reaching initial liquefaction. And more importantly to this study, we can see that in the DM simulations, there is an even more clear trend that um, large post liquefaction shear strain is generated at zero effective stress. And we also see this accumulation of gamma naught with increasing load cycles, eventually reaching a saturated state. So this shows that our DM simulations are able to capture the cyclic behavior observed in lab tests, and it reproduces and confirms the generation and eventual saturation of post liquefaction shear strain at zero effective stress. Uh, before we look at more micromechanical quantities, first we would look uh, we would like to take a look at a more conventional um, measure that affects many of soil's behaviors, which is void ratio E. So we conducted different tests on um, samples with different loading histories. So what we did was that first we conducted undrained cyclic tests on virgin consolidated soil. And then after these undrained cyclic tests, uh, we reconsolidated the samples again and did the tests again. Um, a second round of undrained cyclic tests. So here we can see that uh, the void ratio has a major influence on post liquefaction shear strain gamma naught. So overall, you see this trend of increasing gamma naught with increasing void ratio or decreasing uh, density. But when we compare the two different sets of tests, we can see that the void ratio does not determine saturated shear strain gamma naught. Uh, there is not a unique relationship between void ratio and gamma naught, or the saturated gamma naught, gamma naught S. So you can see here, you can have um, samples with the same void ratio, but drastically different gamma naught, or almost the same gamma naught, but distinctly different void ratios. So this means that loading history also plays a role. However, loading history is not a state variable. So there must be something that is changing within the soil that causes uh, this post liquefaction shear strain to be different. What is it? So on the micromechanical um, side, we first look at the coordination number, which is the average number of contacts per particle. And in our 2D DM simulations, we can see that prior to loading, um, the initial contact uh, coordination number is about three. As undrained cyclic loading um, progresses, uh, we can see a progressive decrease in coordination number. And as the coordination number decreases further um, below a value of 2.2 in our tests, we observe that soil enters into liquefaction state. Now this means that the contacts and internal arrangement of particles plays an important role in liquefaction or more specifically, the lack of contacts plays a more, an important role in liquefaction. So uh, let's consider the micromechanical structure of particles. In 2D, if we look at a particle, we can say that you need three contacts for a particle to bear contact load stably. So on the top one here, when we have two contacts, this is a non-stable contact load bearing structure. So it will move under contact loads. Whereas if you have three or more contacts, you generally have a more stable structure. Now this is consistent with our observation for coordination number. When the coordination number drops below a certain value, the sample loses its ability to bear load and hence liquefy. So this means that the lack of contacts at liquefaction allows for the large deformation that we observed. Based on these understanding of the micromechanical structure of the uh, particles, what we proposed was a new fabric measure to quantify the loss of contacts during liquefaction. And this new fabric measure is called the mean neighboring particle distance or MNPD. It is defined as the overall average of the mean surface-to-surface -surface distance between every particle 
and its n closest neighboring particles in a granular assembly. Now this number n is the number of contacts needed to support stable load bearing structure. So in 2D, as we described before, it should be 3. Now in 3D, this number would be 4. So if we look at a non-liquefaction state where your particles have solid contact network, now most of your particles would have about three contacts, then the MPD value uh, of this particle would be zero. And overall, you would have a very small M MPD measure. Now, at liquefaction state, we know that particles lose contact and each particle may have some different, uh, uh, may have some distances to its nearest particles. Then you would have a larger MMPD value. So the MMPD fabric is proposed with the notion to reflect the amount of rearrangement that is needed to reach a load bearing state. So from a state where your particles lose contact, you need some sort of a rearrangement so that these distances again reduces to zero. So the smaller MMPD is, the more stable the granular assembly should be. Now we can uh, take a look at how this mean neighboring particle distance evolves during uh, undrained cyclic loading. We take a snapshot of one load cycle and we can see that initially after reaching liquefaction state, this MMPD value increases to a peak and we observe that at the liquefaction state, most of our particles have two or fewer contacts. Now, if we continue to load at the zero effective stress during undrained loading, eventually MMPD reduces to a small value and then the soil dilates again to reach a non-liquefaction state where most of our particles have three contacts. Now, if we plot the peak MMPD value during each load cycle alongside with the gamma naught of each load cycle, we can see that the MMPD max or the peak MMPD value in each post liquefaction cycle follows almost exactly the same trend of increase um, and eventual saturation as gamma naught. And there is a very strong correlation in the test between MMPD max and gamma naught. Now, if we conduct a whole lot of different tests with different void ratios, different um, loading histories, we can see that there is a very unique correlation between MMPD max and gamma naught in each post liquefaction cycle. And this relationship is irrelevant of void ratio, irrelevant of loading history. So this means that we have found the micromechanical origin, which is MMPD, that governs the post liquefaction shear strain that we observe on macro scale. Now that we know the micromechanical origin of post liquefaction shear strain, we still need to bridge the gap between micro and macro. So we now have this micro scale fabric MMPD, and we know that on a macro scale it manifests in this in the form of large post-liquefaction shear strain. However, there is still a missing link. The change in MMPD must induce some change in, mechanical, in the mechanical property of the soil so as to allow for this large post-liquefaction shear strain. Now, this missing link actually lies within dilatancy. If we look at um, the dilatancy of sand under undrained cyclic loading, we can see that as we approach liquefaction, the soil is contraction in contraction. So you can see this decrease in mean effective stress. Now, when we leave liquefaction state, we have an increase in mean effective stress and the soil is in dilation. But the question is, what happens at this liquefaction state at zero effective stress. Is it in a neutral state or is it in a contraction or dilation state? Now, most people would tend to initially guess that this is in a neutral state at liquefaction. However, this does not make sense because before reaching zero effective stress, the soil is actually in contraction. So if you reach a neutral state 
um, at zero effective stress, then that means you have to jump from a contraction state immediately once you reach zero effective stress to a neutral state. So there's a gap there. We need, with the help of DM, we can actually quantify the dilatancy at liquefaction state. Uh, however, there is an obstacle here. Um, it is very difficult to quantify dilatancy during undrained loading. Uh, if we look at the definition of dilatancy, we see that dilatancy is the increment of vol plastic volumetric strain over the increment of plastic shear strain. Now, how do we measure the plastic strains, strain increments in undrained loading? This is a difficult challenge. Now, in order to solve for dilatancy during undrained loading, we proposed an alternative way of measuring it. Uh, what we do is that during undrained loading, we can take a snapshot of the sample at any state, for example here at A. Then we can conduct constant strain increment ratio probes. So we keep the d epsilon v over d gamma as constant. And for different values of d epsilon v over d gamma, we can have a we can have a probe that allows us to achieve the increment of mean effective stress dp equal to zero. Now, when dp equals to zero, uh, we can easily calculate dilatancy using this formulation or this equation at the bottom here. And using this approach. Uh, we, are, we were able to measure the dilatancy of uh, during undrained cyclic loading of several different samples. And we can see that the dilatancy observed at non liquefaction states agrees with current understanding of the dilatancy deviatoric stress ratio relationship or D eta relationship. So this relationship is almost linear, and the looser samples tend to have uh, behave more in contraction or stronger contraction, and the phase transformation angle for looser sample is greater. So now that we have quantified uh, dilatancy at non-liquefaction states, we need to look at the liquefaction state. Again, um, following the definition of dilatancy, um, if we are able to achieve dp equal to zero, then we should be able to use constant strain increment probes um, to quantify dilatancy. Now, one of the good things about liquefaction is that at liquefaction state, if you sustain liquefaction state as in dp equal to zero, then you have p equal to zero and q equal to zero. So you have zero elastic strain. So the calculation of dilatancy is simplified. And we can see that undrained loading actually naturally satisfies our criteria of dp equal to zero and dq equal to zero. And dilatancy can be calculated as d equal to zero. Does that solve our problem? Unfortunately, not. So what we can do is that at one of the liquefaction states, we take a snapshot and then we do different constant strain increment ratio probes. For example, we have uh, d epsilon v over d gamma of 0 0.05 or 0 0.1. Then we can see that um, liquefaction can still be sustained albeit for different values of shear strain. So this means that uh, the d equal to zero solution is non-unique, and we have infinite solutions to dilatancy d at zero effective stress. These infinite number of solutions are all potentially solutions to dilatancy at zero effective stress state or at liquefaction state. Um, what we observe is that there exists a maximum d epsilon v over d gamma probe that allows liquefaction to be sustained. And in this test here, we can see that when d epsilon v over d gamma reaches 12, liquefaction is stopped immediately and we the soil exits liquefaction and reaches non-liquefaction state immediately. So this maximum contraction probe is actually a reflection of the potential of the soil at liquefaction state to be able to contract. So we can call this potential uh, the contraction potential d naught. If we measure the d naught during an undrained loading process at the liquefaction state, we can see this contraction potential d naught evolves at liquefaction. 
So as we enter into the contraction state, it is initially equal to the actual contraction prior to entering into the contraction state. And as the shear strain increases, we have an accumulation of this contraction potential. And then this contraction potential starts to release. And once it is fully released to zero, your soil begins to be able to dilate again and leaves the liquefaction state. And we also observe that this, the peak value of D0, D0 max during each load cycle follows the same trend of increase with load cycle as is with gamma naught. Now, this is a reminiscent of what we observed for MMPD. If we plot the evolution of D0 and MMPD for the same load cycles, we can see that the evolution trend of D0 and MMPD are very similar. And if we plot all the values in different tests and different load cycles, we can see that there is a unique MMPD, D0 and gamma naught relation. This means that on the micro scale, we have a fabric evolution, which is MMPD evolution that changes the arrangement of the particles. And this in turn affects our mechanical property of the soil, which is dilatancy in the form of contraction potential. And this in turn manifests itself in the micro scale post liquefaction shear strain that we observe. So now we can describe the complete dilatancy evolution process during undrained cyclic loading. So initially, during undrained cyclic loading, as we move in towards liquefaction, contraction causes sand to move towards liquefaction. Now, once soil reaches initial liquefaction or zero effective stress, then your contraction changes into a contraction potential. And this contraction potential accumulates first during loading, during the accumulation of post liquefaction shear strain, and then it starts to release after reaching a peak. And as contraction potential is fully released to zero, sand begins to dilate again and leaves liquefaction state. So finally, for my conclusions, um, the conclusions are actually quite clear. There's only three really main take home messages. So first is uh, our observation. We observe that large but bounded post liquefaction shear strain occurs at liquefaction state under undrained loading. Now this post liquefaction shear strain on the micro scale is found to be governed by the particle arrangement evolution, which is quantified by a newly proposed fabric called MMPD or mean neighboring particle distance. And we find that sand at liquefaction state exhibits contraction potential. So it still has dilatancy. And this contraction potential accommodates post liquefaction shear strain, which is the manifestation of MMPD evolution. That brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.